I wonder if anybody has been able to memorize the scripture that we're working on right now. That sounded uncomfortable when I just said that. Okay. There, there are a few more of these cards that are in the back, I think, on the table when you come in. Uh, I, this isn't a guilt thing. I would love for you to be able to, uh, for all of us to get this scripture in us. And uh, I have read this a lot more than you have. And it sometimes, sometimes it doesn't stick uh, in my own head. So uh, I, I hope that this will be something, because we're going to be thinking about this not only this week, but again, one more week, that verse where in Colossians 2, the letter that Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, we were looking at this for three weeks. We said, we want to be able to really get deep into this passage. And he says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you were taught, and abounding or overabounding in thankfulness. So that's in Colossians 2. So we're, we're going to be looking at this. This is one of my all-time favorite verses, and I hope that over these three weeks that it will become at least one of your favorites as well, that we can help our hearts to line up with what God wants for us, that we would have a flourishing faith, a faith that is growing and vibrant. Go ahead and put up the next slide. In Colossians, in that verse, uh, what this, I, I don't know if you heard it when I was reciting it, but what Paul is doing is he's using an image of a tree, and he's kind of building it from the bottom up. So he says that you should be rooted and built up in him. That's what we talked about last week. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught. It's kind of an image of the, of the trunk and overflowing with thankfulness. So you think about the leaves and the fruit coming out from the tree. So it's this image of a vibrant tree with deep roots, and a strong trunk, and with green leaves and lots of fruit. It's an, an image of a beautiful tree, but it's also an image meant to describe flourishing faith. So our objective isn't just for our faith to survive. What we want, what you want, is for your faith in Christ to be healthy and growing, vibrant, being able to give to others as well. And oftentimes when we think about a flourishing tree, we think immediately of the fruit part, right? We think of the tree and how much it's giving to us. In my backyard, we have a, a big pomegranate tree, and I see a lot of pomegranates coming. The squirrels are trying to take all of the good stuff, but uh, hopefully there'll be something left over in the end. But in order to get the fruit, you need the trunk to stay strong, and you need the roots to be in good soil as well. So Christians, we are rooted in the soil of Christ, and that is, we are never supposed to move out from that. Our faith, it continues to grow in the soil of the gospel, to be in the life of Christ. It's sustained by him, and we shouldn't be tempted to try to root ourselves anywhere else. That's what we talked about last week. Then the apostle moves up in the tree. He says, strengthen in the faith as you were taught. In other translations, that's in verse 7 if you're following along with me, Colossians 2, 7. In other translations, it doesn't say strengthened, it says established in the faith as you were taught. A couple of years ago, I was down in Torrance. My wife and I went down to Torrance to go visit with a friend of ours who lives down there and uh, a college friend named Gwen. And during the time of COVID shutdown, one of the, her hobbies that she did was she started to to kind of grow some more plants in her backyard, and she wanted to have that as her hobby to kind of have a few things going. And I made a passing remark about one of her citrus trees saying, hey, that's so cool. And she's like, I grew that from its own seed. Like, I've been growing this. And she said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give you one. And so at some point then, later on, she brought me a little sapling, and I had to take care of it. I put it in a, in a half barrel, and it started to take care of it and go ahead and put it up. This is what it's looking like now. So it's been, uh, it's only been, a, I think it's a couple years now. It's starting to really grow up and start to have a bit more. In the beginning, I had to take so much care of it. I had to be really careful. You know, when it would get extra hot. I don't think I always did a very good job of looking after it. Sometimes it got hot and it started to lose a few leaves and it looked a little sad. Uh, but it's starting to be able to handle itself a little bit better. It's becoming more established. It's getting stronger, and it's able to hold up a bit more, and that's what it's supposed to do. So as it matures, it becomes actually more hardy, and that's what we want for our faith. That's a bit of what we're talking about today, for us to be stronger, for us to be established, for us to be a bit more hardy 
in our faith. A lot of you have citrus trees in your yard. You know what it's like when the tree comes to maturity. It gives you too many uh, uh, lemons or oranges or whatever that you, can, that you can have. You can hardly keep up with it. And you don't even really have to water it very much. At some point, it's able to handle it itself. Your tree is established. Your tree is now resilient because it's hardy enough. And that's what we want. We want our faith to be resilient, that it can handle whatever comes at it in life because it's been established. That's what Paul is praying for them. That's what he's asking for them. He's, he's praying, Lord, I want you to have these things so that their faith won't be shaky, so that it won't be tempted to head off in any other direction. That's what you want your faith to look like. In fact, every Christian needs to have their faith strengthened. So go ahead and put up the, that next slide. We need our strength we need our faith to be strengthened, and we want to do it in four different areas. We're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about having our faith strengthened in relation to God, in relation to people, in relation to life's trials, and in relation to worldly temptations. We want our faith to be, uh, to be strengthened in all these areas, God and people, life's trials, and worldly temptations. You might have one area of these that feels like it needs a little bit more than others. That's fine. But I want to tell you, every Christian needs to be strengthened in all of these things. No matter how long you've been a Jesus follower, you can learn more about God and be strengthened. No matter how long you have been a Christ follower, you can be strengthened in facing worldly temptations. All of these things. Let's, let's pray as we get into this. Lord, we, we, we thank you that you are here. Thank you that you are a God who is active in our lives. Father, we want you to be glorified. So help us now to understand what it means to be strengthened in Christ. By your Holy Spirit, shape us to be who you want us to be. Turn us so that we will look on you and, and not be established in anything else other than you. Because we know that's the good life. It may not be the easy life, but it is the good, right, whole life that we want and that we need. So we ask you to help us to do that today for Christ's sake. Amen. All right, let's talk about that first one. So being established or mature, strong, hearty, all of those words, those things, in relation to God. That's where we're going to begin. And I'll just say this, this first point is the longest. It's not very strange. I think you understand that God is kind of a big part of our faith, right? We want to do that. That's fine. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so, so then, I just want to read this again. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So you can, you can understand where I'm going, right? Taken rooted last week, strengthened in the faith this week, and next week we're going to do overflowing with thankfulness. So the context of the whole passage is that Paul is praying fervently. He's fighting for them in prayer. He's wrestling for them because he doesn't want them to be swayed by false teaching. He wants them to, to stay with Jesus. And, and that false te teaching, we said, it extends into lots of different areas. And, but it begins here for us to be established in something else or rooted in something else. So our faith needs to be strengthened in relation to God. It's how we know God. Not just knowing about him, but to actually know God. And we know God, first of all and foremost, through his word. It's where God has, has provided for us to know what he is like, who he is, is for us to know him through his word. So we need to, we need to hear God's word and, and respond faithfully to what we hear, to allow our minds to be shaped by what's in scripture. To, to, but even, I'll say, in studying scripture, you can still be, we can still be led astray. And that's why it's really interesting that, that in that sentence, he says, he says, to be strengthened in the faith as you were taught. I think it's an interesting phrase. Uh, so Paul, he's starting with this assumption that, that these believers in Colossae had good teaching to begin with. Uh, they, they learned about Christ from a guy named Epaphras. He says that in another part in the letter. He says, hey, you learned about Christ from Epaphras. I know him. I know he taught you good stuff. So I want you to continue in the faith as you were taught. And the problem now is that there are these harmful teachings that are coming in from the outside that are spreading like a virus, spreading like a wildfire among them. And so he's calling on them. He says, hey, I don't want you to, to give in to that stuff. I want you to stick in line with the teaching that has come down 
from the apostles. The apostles have taught the faith truthfully, and you guys heard it that way. I will say, not everyone who is here this morning, or if you're online, not all of us started off on our teaching with, with teaching that was in line with the apostles' teaching. Uh, maybe you started off in a, in a maybe you started off a far away from Christ. Maybe the, the first experience you had with the Bible was not good, or maybe you had some other traumatic experience with that. But for the Colossians, he could say, as you were taught. And, and I would say, if you did grow up and it, you didn't get as good a teaching, we should say, as you should have been taught. Stay in line with the teaching as you should have been taught. So our, our faith, it's matured, it matures and it is established when it's connected with true teaching about who Christ is. And, and it is expressed in the way that it was handed down to us from the apostles. Where do we find that kind of teaching? Well, we find it in Scripture, but we want to, whatever teaching we have should be in line with that. We find the, in the words of Scripture, in the Gospels, in the words of Jesus, in the letters that were written to the early church. All of that, our faith needs to be in line with that. Speaking of trees, maybe you've noticed that we've planted a lot of new trees in the front of the church in recent months. You will notice that most of those trees, I think, as they're planted, they have two stakes on each side of them. So we, we put in two firm stakes, and they, they lash the young tree to each of those straight wooden posts. And, and the reason that we do that is to protect those young trees, to help them to grow up straight, to help them to grow true the way that they are supposed to. And, and the apostles' teaching that we're being told by Paul here is kind of like those straight posts. It guides our faith in the way that we have been taught. And we, we don't, that way we will grow in line, in a straight line like the apostles did. So we want to have a faith that grows straight and true, so it's strong in the right way and it doesn't go in a, in a strange direction. Well, there's, there's lots in the New Testament that shows us about this kind of thing, that, that the believers, when they come to faith, that they were supposed to have a faith that was in line with what the apostles t- taught. Just in the very beginning of the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a history book that d- uh, talks about what happened in the early church after Jesus left, and how did the church develop? And there was a big event during Pentecost, uh, a festival, and the, the apostles were speaking to a big crowd. And it says that a whole bunch of people came to faith that day and were baptized. And it says this about them. This is in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves, these people who came to faith, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then it says afterwards that they shared their belongings together and they cared for each other's needs. But we can see that from the beginning, one of the things that they did, they devoted themselves to breaking of bread. They're, they're sharing fellowship around the table, but also having the Lord's Supper together. They're praying. They're spending time in fellowship to spend time to encourage one another. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They said, we need to learn what it means now for us to follow Jesus. So we're supposed to be strengthened in that line. Hebrews 13 says this, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So it's supposed to even act like them. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. That's the message from the apostles not by foods that have no benefit to those devoted to them. So don't get distracted onto other things. We need to have our hearts strengthened by grace, to be, to be strengthened from the message of the cross and what Christ has done for us. And, and I will say the great creeds of the faith are really helpful for us here to stay in line with that apostle's teaching. Being in line with the apostles' teaching and being strengthened in our faith in God, though, doesn't mean that we don't have questions. We can have questions about our faith. We can, we can wonder. I think, actually, as our faith matures, it's possible that you will have more questions. That maybe you've experienced this yourself, that as you started to follow Jesus and as you knew more about Scripture, as you know more about what it means to follow him, maybe, maybe some of the answers that were really simple for you before in life became a little more complicated. It wasn't so black and white, but you realize, maybe I don't know exactly. So we can be convinced that God is in something, 
but we can also have a little bit more freedom to allow ourselves to, to ask big questions, ask scary questions. Maybe our, our faith in God isn't going to be shaken because we know, we know God, and we know that he can handle us in the midst of struggling with some big questions. We also have some space for other people to be asking questions too. So that's the beauty of our resilience in God. We're resilient. We're able to be more resilient to false teaching because we know what that is, because we know God's voice. I, I heard somebody recently say, he said, when, when his wife called him on the phone, in the, in the age before you had the caller ID and you could see who it was, but, but when, when his wife would call him on the phone and she would say, hey, he didn't say, hello, who is this? Can I, may I ask who you're looking for? You don't have to, because he knows her voice. And when, when she says, hey, he goes, oh, hi, how are you? you know, we know somebody's voice automatically. We know who that is. And that's how we should be with God. As we get to know God more, we can begin to discern his voice. We can hear his voice and know who he is when he just says, hey. We don't have to go farther than that. So that allows us to be resilient against false teaching when we say, that doesn't sound like God's voice. That sounds more like the accuser's voice when we're told things that you're no good or we hear false teaching about what God is like. So we can be, as we are comfortable in those things and do know God, we can also be more comfortable in holding strongly to the essentials while we can allow for there to be some differences in the non-essentials. That's, that's a distinctive of the covenant church. We want to major in the majors. And uh, sometimes we do not agree all the way across with everybody with us. But we, because we are more mature in our faith, we can start to have a bit more maturity to allow other people to not have to agree with us on every little thing. So that's, that's what a mature person looks like. That's what a mature person looks like in life, right? That you're able to handle when somebody doesn't agree with you on all ways about raising their kids or about what, how they keep their house or something like that. We don't have to have that in the same way. We don't have to be threatened by other people. We're not threatened or intimidated by false teaching. We can, we can face that. Maybe you're not in a place in your faith where you can handle that, but I, I have enjoyed talking with Alan Bashar and how much he loves to talk with uh, people who, are, who have false teaching about things. He loves it when somebody comes and knocks on his door. He's the only guy I know who loves it. He's like, yes, you're here. Come in, right? So... I love that. I love that. Maybe you're not in the place in your faith where you love that. Maybe that doesn't, that doesn't get you excited, but he's not threatened anymore by that because he knows who Jesus is, and, and, I, and he knows what God's voice sounds like, so he's not threatened by false teaching. It, it's a challenge for him to figure out how he can answer them well, and maybe that's something that would excite you. I, I can think of some other people here who I know would enjoy a little bit of a, a scrap about that kind of stuff. <laughs> But we also don't have to be intimidated, like I said, we don't have to be intimidated by secondary differences. So we can hold to the unity of believers without thinking that everyone needs to think the same as us. So here's the question. Are you growing stronger in relation to God? Are you growing stronger? Are you more established now than before? All right, I said we were going to talk longer about God than the other ones. Are you more established I think it's, it's helpful. Just to pause. We're going to ask that question after each one, or one like that. It's okay if the answer is no. It's, it's not okay if the answer stays no. Because right? we we we're all allowed to be beginners, and we're all allowed to make mistakes. But it's helpful for us to say, can I be truthful with myself? Am, am I actually getting stronger? Am, am I more established than I was five years ago? And maybe the answer, if the answer is no, then what are we going to do about that? What do you think God wants us to do? What is our part and what is God's part in that? All right, secondly, go to the next one. So we need to be established. We need to be mature and strong and, and hearty and, and established in relation to people. And, and I'm thinking about other people, but I think, you know, it relates to myself and how I view myself too. I'm included in the people. Uh, our natural inclination when we think about other people is either, this is the, the bad way, is either for us to treat other people as a means to an end or to hold them up on too high of a pedestal. So if we want to treat them as a means to the end, then if they're advancing our agenda, 
If they're doing what we want, if they're bringing some positive good in our life, then they are a good person. On the other end of the spectrum is, hey, we want to deify this person. We want to make them almost as important as God. What happens with them is the most important. That's the ultimate importance. And, and if we think, about, uh, we think about the solar system, the solar system, oftentimes what ends up happening is we put ourselves at the center and we want everything to revolve around us. Or we put somebody else. I want to, it's a real temptation for a lot of us. We put other people in their needs. It could be your spouse. It could be your kids. It could be your parents. It could be your job. We put that other thing in the center of our importance, and everything revolves around that. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. People aren't a means to an end. You don't want to be treated that way. And people aren't supposed to be the center of gravity for us either. They never can handle that much weight. We can't handle the weight of that much responsibility. God is supposed to be the center of our relational solar system. That God is at the center and everything revolves around him, not in some other way. He's the center of gravity with everything revolving around him. So if you are a mature Christian, a maturing Christian, then you're going to be able to see yourself and know that other people are more thoroughly sinful than you would have thought possible. But because of the message of the gospel, we believe that we are more loved than we could ever hope. So that shapes the way that we see other people. It shapes the way we see ourselves. And it gives us a right perspective about things. And so if we are maturing, then we're going to be able to see people and have people stay in their right place. They don't get to take the place of God. They can't handle the weight of that responsibility anyway. And you don't have to bear the weight of that responsibility. So what are a couple of things that if we have a, a biblical view, a, a right strength or established faith in, 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 with regard to people, what's it going to produce in us? I think that was a, a good question. What should it produce in us? I think it's going to produce at least a couple of things. It's going to produce vulnerability in us. We're going to start to have more authentic relationships with other people if we put ourselves in right relation, if we're established in the faith in relation to people, because we're going we're gonna to be able to show our vulnerability by, by being quick to apologize because my sinfulness was showing. And I apologize. I, I'm, I'm sorry. A, a real apology. I should not have said that. You didn't even know what I thought. That's just what came out, right? We, we can forgive freely. When we think about being a Christian, we think of Christians, our people are supposed to forgive freely freely. And what that means is for us, we are loved sinners. We know that we are, we are sinners who are loved well by God. And if we believe that, then we're not going to expect perfection from other people. We're not going to expect it from ourselves either. The constant temptation is for our spirituality to, it's, it's a subtle thing, but to kind of go off track by seeing spirituality or following Christ as something about being good. We think that, that that is the way that we will be able to have God care for us. That's not the message of the gospel at all. The message of the gospel says that God loved us even when we weren't good, when we were his enemies even. But if we, if we even just think about that, the, the message of trying to be good is at odds with this idea of vulnerability. Because if, if, if my spirituality is about being good, then if ever I show vulnerability, I show that I'm not. But the problem is what I want to show people is that God is good. I want to show people that God is the one who is powerful. And so if he loves a person like me, I, I'm more free to be vulnerable. and say, God, you, you do love me. You, lo you know. You know the things I'm insecure about. You know the things that I don't love. You know the ways that I'm blind even to who I am. But God loves us. We don't have to keep up appearances to, to be good, to be seen as being good. Instead, we can let people see the real us. We can let people in. A mature faith in Christ rejects that pull toward a spirituality of being good. It's not about that. It's about being in Christ. We can embrace our messiness. I think along with that vulnerability, the other thing it could produce in us is a certain amount of courage. And I think those two are linked. If we are mature, then we are not going to be afraid of making mistakes. 
somebody who is weak, if you feel weak, if you feel like I have no power, you're not going to take any, any chances to make mistakes. Because you don't want to make, take a risk, you don't want to make a mistake, you don't want to take a risk, even some positive risks that you could be taking. But it's going to allow us to be courageous. Because even if you go for it and you fall on your face, God was there and you are giving it a go. So I think if we, are, if we view people in a more mature way, it's going to make us more vulnerable because we can connect with other people and it's going to make us more courageous so we can try some big things in faith. All right, third. Oh, I, I didn't ask my question. So the question, are you growing stronger in your relation to people, uh, relationally and even how you view other people and see yourself? Are you getting stronger in your faith? Are you less moved around by the waves of the world? All right. Third, so are you strengthened in relations to life's trials? We have to face our life, all the challenges with an unwavering faith. That's, that's the perfect. We want to be able to face this with unwavering faith. And, and a person who is established in their faith is going to be able to increasingly, let's say, or over the trajectory of their life, increasingly be resilient in difficulty. Maybe even, we could say, recover quickly from adversity. Uh, it, it's going to make us more resilient to life circumstances. So let's be clear, that doesn't mean that life circumstances don't happen to us. They do. Life happens to us, and, and calamity comes to us, and dumb decisions are made by us so that they bring about these situations. And we're going to have different responses to those things, for good or for bad. We have, a, we have a strong view of how people are, right? We know that it's okay that we fluctuate because God doesn't. But overall, over time, we are hopefully going to be more and more resilient to life's trials. Not, not cold to them, but maybe we grieve differently, as it says in Scripture. We grieve differently. James 1.4 says this, uh, we're supposed to be resilient to life circumstances. He says, it, it is in the fruit of perseverance that we continue. He says this, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James 1.4. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. So if we're moving toward maturity, if we're moving toward being established to be hardy, then part of that is, is actually the work of perseverance. That we're, we're, as we continue on in life, that we are facing difficulties, and those things actually help us to mature. So when we find a situation where we have to actually persevere, it means that, that you are facing something difficult. You're facing something that you didn't want to, maybe. It might be something that you've never faced before, or you might be facing a circumstance that's just been continuing for a long time, and you say, God, this needs more perseverance than I want to demonstrate. But when we do that, what we're, we need to do is to not res draw on our own reserves. It's not based on how much Kurt has got in him, but we're growing stronger by where our roots are, and our roots are in Christ. And a strong trunk keeps it from being swayed and pulled out from those roots. Christ is our source. So we, we build up our confidence in Christ. If you're in a good time right now, I want to say, why don't you work to push your roots deep in Christ right now? Because when you face a difficult situation, you're going to need that strength that comes from those roots. If you are in a difficult situation right now, push your roots into Christ, what God thinks about you. Because there's going to be situations where we feel like, maybe you even feel like God isn't even there. Is God even listening to me in these circumstances? But we can know that we're not facing those things alone, even if it feels like that. We, we are confident about who God is. We know that God is true to his word, though, and he's not going to leave us or forsake us, even in times of great difficulty. If you are in a moment of difficulty, I want to share something that a covenant pastor named Art Greco said last year in a talk. He said, there's always something on the other side of not giving up. I like that. There's always something on the other side of not giving up. 
So perseverance, let perseverance do its work in you so you may be mature that you can be established in the faith as you were taught. So here's a question. Are you growing stronger in relation to life's trials? I don't mean that you never cried. I don't mean that something wasn't devastating. That's not the point. The, the question is, does it derail us? Are we, are we able to persevere in this thing in, in faith in some way? God, I have no idea how you're involved in this, but I know that you're here. And I, there's a difference between saying, God, this is wrong, and, and thinking, I, I don't think God's here. Are you more established? Are you stronger? All right, last one. Uh, are we going to be more established in relation to worldly temptations? This is for all of us facing these worldly temptations. To, for Jesus, Jesus, when he talked about this, he says that being immature is related to being choked out by life's worries. Can anyone relate? We have life's worries that come at us, and it keeps us from being mature. He says that the riches of this life and the pleasures are also things that choke it out. Jesus told a story about the parable of the sower, of the seed that goes out, and one of them falls among the thorns. And the thorns, it says, well, he says this. This is in Luke 8. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear the word of God, but they go on their way and they are choked out by life's worries and riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. They are not established. They aren't getting stronger. They aren't hardy because they got choked out by those things. But he says, but the seed that fell on good soil stands for those who are noble, with a noble and a good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a good crop. I like that Jesus brought those things together. So there's a persevering, sticking with it in faith. So we know that the world has a lot of things that can trip us up. We're supposed to be able to, over time, as we mature, we, we're, we're going to be more confident to be able to see what is good and bad. Uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about how you should, have produ you should be beyond milk now. You should be on solid food. But solid food is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So we're supposed to be exercising, exercising our muscles to resist the temptations of the world, of the riches and greed and selfishness and... Uh, of all the things that can draw us away from God in the world. There's, a, there's, a, there's an allure to that. So we need to be strengthened so we can face that. So I want to ask that last question. Are you growing stronger in relation to worldly temptations? And it always needs to be connected to this life in Christ. All right, well, I said in the beginning, how, how are we going to get wiser? Taylor Swift. Thank you. Can I get an Amen. Taylor Swift, in her song, Antihero, it starts off like this. I have this thing where I get older, but, I just never, but I'm just never wiser. I have this thing where I get older, but just never wiser. And so she is right. Just adding years to your life doesn't make you wiser. I know that because I've experienced it. Okay? She's like tw 33. So what does she know? But she's, yeah, Whatever. But she is right that, that adding years to our life doesn't automatically equate to wisdom. And in a similar way, I will say just adding years at church or being involved with God doesn't necessarily equate to us being stronger in our faith. It's not automatic. Just sticking around is not going to be good enough. It's not going to get you there. So we need to actively, proactively participate with the Spirit. So I, I want to phrase that really carefully because it's not, it's, we're not scratching our way to maturity. That's the direction that the Holy Spirit wants to take us in. The Holy Spirit is trying to point us to Christ so our life is rooted and strengthened in Christ. So we need to partner with Him and not fight against the Spirit. So I'm, I'm curious. Go ahead and put up the next the question for our question. This is what I would like for you to think about this week. So it's not just about sticking around longer. So here, in what area do I most need God to strengthen my faith? Because if we're going to strengthen our faith, it's not going to be by us just muscling it up. We need God to do it. So I wonder which of these four areas you feel like you need God to strengthen your faith in. Because it's not going to come down to strengthening ourselves. We've got to stop fighting the work of the Holy Spirit. 
He wants to bring us to maturity. He wants us to be rooted in Christ, to be strengthened in the faith as we were taught, to be abounding in thankfulness. But maybe you don't feel super strong in, in what you know about God, in, in how you feel about other people or think about yourself, or the way that you handle life's trials, or even the way that you are facing temptation. All right, we, this is going to be the way that we're going to kind of wrap this up. I would like for you to turn to your neighbor. And I would like for you to pick an area. So turn to the person or a couple people next to you. Don't complain. Get stronger. Okay. Let's get mature. Get stronger. It's okay. I know you're facing a life trial right now. You're turning to your neighbor. I know it's really difficult. Yeah. So I know it's hard for you, but new experiences are good for us. By perseverance, it moves you toward maturity. Good job. So what I want you to do is I want you to say to the person next to you, what, pick one of those areas. This is an area where I want God to help me mature. You don't have to say what it is. Just say the category, okay? Extra points if you say worldly temptations. Okay. <laughs> just a couple minutes. Just tell, tell the person next to you. And I would like, here's what I want you to do. I would like for you to turn to that person and pray for them. Pray together. Pray together about that thing. A few moments later. He's back. You did it? You survived? Did you talk to your neighbor? John, did you talk to your neighbor? Yeah? Okay. Nobody got left alone. That's good. So, here's the thing. All of us, I said this before, all of us need to be strengthened in all four of these areas. All of us need all of these. And we had to pick one to say, hey, I need this uh, right now. But all of us need to be strengthened in all of these things. I'm encouraged. I, I would like to close just with Romans 8. It says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. You can hear the difficulty in that. No, in all these things we are more the, than conquerors. How? Through him who loved us. So I, I pray that you will face what the difficulties regarding God or people or life's trials or temptation, and that at the end of it, you're not going to say, I'm a great person. I face these things. But God is so good. God strengthening, is strengthening me in times when I don't even want to be strengthened. God is with me in these trials and temptations because God is bigger than we think, and he can strengthen you. May it be so. Let's pray. Lord, we, we ask you to strengthen us, to help us to grow. That's the, way, the direction that plants are supposed to go. May we be rooted in you, strengthened in the faith as we were taught, because we want you to get the glory. It's not about us, it's about you. May you be, may we see you for as big as you are in, in the midst of whatever difficulty we are facing. God, we pray for those who are, who are wavering in their faith, those who are having difficulty in relationships with themselves. And we pray as well for everyone who is facing trials or temptations that you will be truly God and big in their eyes. We pray in your name. Amen. All right.